Welcome to Medicine Dish. I'm Kitty Marks, Director of the CMS Tribal Affairs Group and your host of today's Medicine Dish. This broadcast will feature experts providing the highlights of an exciting event that took place in July 2010 at the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. to stimulate the development of Medicaid and Medicare data for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and the providers on whom they rely for health care. All this and more on today's installment of Medicine Dish. And again, welcome to Medicine Dish. As I mentioned earlier, today's topic is data. But first, let's take just a minute to review what the Medicine Dish is and how you can use the information. The Medicine Dish introduces you to various topics pertinent to healthcare programs operated by the Indian Health Service, tribes, tribal organizations, and urban Indian health programs. Medicine Dish is now broadcast on the third Wednesday of every other month at 1.30 Eastern Time and can be seen over the web through a partnership with the National Institutes of Health at videocast.nih.gov. The next show will air on June 15th. All of the shows are archived at videocast.nih.gov and are easy to access if you can't watch at the regularly scheduled time or want to review the information. You can also find us on YouTube. Just do a search for Medicine Dish. And now let's turn to the topic for today's Medicine Dish broadcast, data. We're being joined by experts from the California Rural Indian Health Board and the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Research at the University of Colorado Denver to share information on how Medicaid and Medicare data is becoming a valuable new tool for improving the funding and use of health care by American Indians and Alaska Natives. I'm going to turn the show over to David Nolly, our moderator for today's show, to introduce our experts. David? Thanks, Kitty. In the summer of 2010, representatives of tribal communities, their health care providers, and federal health care funding agencies got together with health policy researchers in a symposium to look at the health care data of American Indians and Alaska Natives. The objective of the group was to integrate their thinking about how to use data to make health and health care better as new legislation changed the role of Medicare and Medicaid in the lives of community members and providers alike. We've brought together a panel of participants from that day. I'm pleased to welcome Jim Crouch from the California Rural Indian Health Board, Carol Kornbrot, also from the California Rural Indian Health Board, and Joan O'Connell from the University of Colorado Denver, Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Research. Thank you all for joining us today. We have a lot of information to cover, so let's try to get started as quickly as we can. And I'd like to start off with you, Jim. Before we get into the details, can you give us some background information on the data symposium? The data symposium was sponsored by the Tribal Affairs Group at CMS and the CMS TTAG, or Tribal Technical Advisory Group, which is a group of tribal health leaders and tribal leaders who are really interested in CMS, IHS uh, interface. Uh, one of the reasons the symposium was important is that uh, CMS is organized by state. Essentially, we're mostly interested in Medicaid money and Medicaid programming issues. And the IHS is organized by 12 regional areas, they're called. So that some of them are multiple state, some of them are single state. So organizing the data in a way that makes sense for Indian policymakers uh, is a critical thing that we're trying to achieve. And the symposium was a, uh, really a showcase for some work that we've done over the last couple of years. 
Now, not everyone in our Medicine Dish audience is a researcher, so can you reassure us that we're going to get practical use out of today's show? I can reassure you that because really data is the basis upon which decisions are made. The community is looking at a lot of issues around health reform uh, and also around the operations of the Indian Health Service itself and the CMS program. And really we use the data uh, to help understand how those, those systems interact. So I'm pretty sure today there will be things that will be useful to administrators and other people who are responsible for the IHS and CMS delivery systems. Okay, Jim, why is it important to have Medicare and Medicaid data for American Indians and Alaska Natives? Well, there are a number of reasons. Probably the most important is that the Indian Health Service system is jointly funded by the Indian Health Service in a uh, direct appropriation and also then their reimbursements from both Medicare and Medicaid. So it's really important that we understand the uh, flow of those funds, the uh, extent to which services are being provided, but more importantly, we can learn a lot from what we're actually doing by looking at those reimbursement data. So it really is important for both planning and for policy reasons and uh, also for improving ultimately the health status of the Indian community. Okay. Jim, why is American Indian Medicare and Medicaid data going to be important as recently passed health legislation such as the Affordable Care Act, Indian Health Care Improvement Act, and the Recovery Act are implemented? Well, there are a number of reasons. First and foremost is there's going to be a great expansion in Medicaid coverages, and that's a major provider of uh, resources for Indian health care. It's going to expand from uh, it, in various states at different levels, but it will span uniformly to 133 percent of the federal poverty level <coughs> for Medicaid. And that population, uh, we don't know a lot about them from our normal uh, data systems, and we're seeking to learn more about the number of Indians and where they're located that uh, will be covered by these new expanded uh, Medicaid coverages. There's a second Indian population that's even more broadly distributed that's not necessarily uh, getting care now through the IHS system that will be eligible for the uh, subsidized uh, private insurance coverages that will be available through the exchange. So those will be the Indians from 133 percent of poverty or up to about 400 percent. And uh, we're seeking to learn more about those populations so we can make sure they're outreached and, and know of the advantages. Uh, there are some really specific Indian benefits in the Indian Health Care Improvement Act and, and in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, first and foremost is that the Indian community has issues around uh, waivers of premiums and co-payments. So we need to be able to identify the Indians so that they can take advantage of those benefits. And then the last part about the health reform bill is that we're interested in Indian participation as being providers of services to the, uh, our clients and uh, how managed care and insurance coverage would uh, include tribal health and IHS facilities in their care provider networks. Another thing about managed care is people were automatically enrolled into managed care whether they wanted to or not and that managed care uh, may not provide them a provider but from hundreds of miles away. And so it's very important that people now, as American Indians, will not be automatically enrolled in managed care, should not be in, automatically enrolled in managed care. They will be able to defer managed care at all from the beginning uh, if, if things, when things are all implemented. Well, thanks, thanks for your input. And for the moment, I want to pick a little bit from your brain, Joan. How can data from the claims of IHS-funded health care providers be used to improve IHS-funded health care and the health status of American Indians and uh, Alaska Natives who use IHS system providers? Okay. Well, data extracted from clinical reporting systems, uh, the resource patient management system, and claims data from Medicaid on inpatient, outpatient, and pharmacy services are being used to more fully understand how more preventive and medically necessary care can be provided to American Indians and Alaska Natives. While reducing hospitalizations and other treatment for complications of diseases that could be avoided. This slide describes three types of care, preventive, primary, and inpatient care. Studies by Dr. Kornbrow and others have shown that a significant percentage of hospitalizations are avoidable through the provision of preventive and primary care. 
it is important to conduct studies to understand how best to improve the provision of these services to reduce the need for hospital care. For example, we did a study of American Indians with diabetes in the Phoenix Indian Medical Center Service Unit that relied on data that is present in Medicaid and Medicare claims. We compared medical complications of the disease, comorbidities, for American Indians with diabetes to those without diabetes. We established the proportions of Indians that were affected by the conditions that develop alongside diabetes but are desirable to prevent entirely or to keep under control. In this first row, you can see the percent of persons with diabetes who have hypertension is much higher than those without diabetes. Similarly, persons with diabetes are more likely to have cardiovascular disease. And this trend persists across the other conditions on the slide. We then compared the disparities in the presence of these complicating conditions and their severity in American Indians with persons with diabetes who were commercially ins insured. To do this, we used a scoring system developed by clinical ex experts that measures severity of medical risk across different clinical conditions. The American Indians with diabetes had a medical risk of 5.4. The score for the U.S. commercially insured adults was 3.6. The risk among the American Indians was about 50% higher. On the right side, you see a similar pattern for American Indians with both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Due to the presence of comorbidities, the American Indians are at much higher risk. We next characterized the use of hospital care and excess treatment costs associated with excess morbidity for American Indians. The American Indians with diabetes represented approximately 11% of the adults in our service population, yet nearly half of all hospitalizations, excluding those for obstetrical care. Furthermore, the same percentage of people with diabetes, 11%, accounted for over a third of treatment costs, much of which was for inpatient stays, and as we noted earlier, a significant percentage of these may be prevented or avoided. What is needed is to track claims data to follow health status, healthcare use, and treatment costs so that we can improve preventive and medically necessary care, like control of blood sugar and regular foot exams, and avoid emergency room visits and hospitalizations for complications such as coma and amputations. The reduction in disparities in health status should follow from such efforts and be documented by reductions in medical risk scores otherwise improvements in health status. And that's why we asked Joan to come and talk at the data symposium because she showed the power of using this data in to actually get at the health status of American Indians to measure it and show how data can be used over time to follow whether health care is being used properly and whether health status is improving and if not to see that funding Go and payments go to reinforce that kind of funding that would improve that health care use and the health status. If this is why we invited her to come speak and why we wanted her on the panel today, too. It shows what we can do with the data, but we're not ready to do that right now. Well, thank you so much, Carol and Joan. But now another question for you, Carol. What Medicaid and Medicare data is being analyzed for American Indian and Alaska Native beneficiaries who utilize the Indian health system providers? We basically have access to eligibility data and to claims data. The eligibility data has enrollment information, and that tells us about the characteristics of the services that the uh, American Indian is eligible for. We also can tell from that demographic information about their age, their sex, and things like that that are important to group the information. From the claims data, or oh, we also, most importantly, can distinguish American Indians and Alaska Natives by racial definition, a self-declared definition, from those who are in the Indian health system of providers and have been determined to either use an IHS, a tribal, or an urban provider, and therefore are in a special category. From the claims data, we can determine what health care services they're using, and we can also determine characteristics of their health status. Finally, and as you've seen from what 
Jim has been talking to you about, we get information about the payments that have been made to the providers for their services. Well, thank you, Carol. Can you give us an example or two of that? Glad to. In this next slide, we see that there's data, similar data to exactly what Jim provided earlier. This is IHS system provider payment data, and this includes the IHS and the tribal providers. There's no data here for the urban uh, populations. This then shows that American uh, Indian beneficiaries on the Medicaid data are what they're receiving from their in payments from their IHS providers in the bottom part of the bars. And in the top part of the bars, you see what the payments amount is for the other providers that they have. This is a beginning. We can look across each of the 12 IHS areas and compare the kinds of services they're getting from the different kinds of providers. And we can find out the whole range of providers that those American Indians are using. Medicaid and Medicare are about the only sources of data where one can find the whole range of providers that the American Indians and Alaska Natives are using. We also have data for IHS eligible American Indians and Alaska Natives and those American Indians who are racially American Indian by self-declaration but are not necessarily eligible for to use the IHS system providers. We can see in the slides and the data that we use that we can compare the range of services that each type of American Indian group gets and we can try to see that both groups get a balanced and, and equitable amount of services. We can look at, at the amount of services that they're getting and the types of care that they get. Okay, thank you, Carol. I would like to, at this point, throw out a question to all of you, so anyone, please feel free to just step up and answer this question as you feel comfortable. What were some of the challenges that you faced? Well, the, the, the first real challenge in any of this work is actually getting permission to have access to the data, mm -hmm. to have uh, ability to uh, do that in a way that's compliant with uh, federal regulations and statutes. Uh, and uh, Carol's worked hard to make this access available to us, and uh, that was probably the first issue. I think the second issue is, again, that the two data sets are so very different. Uh, the IHS is organized by its 12 provider areas, and uh, each local provider has a very, very different mix of services. So uh, getting a handle on uh, what's available through the IHS system by uh, looking at Medicaid data uh, helped us get beyond that problem. Okay. Now, this question I'm, I'm directing to you since you responded, but again, this is for anyone. Mm -hmm. Can you point to any situations where you've used the data that's become available as a result of this project? Well, the, um, I guess I can't think of a specific one. What are you thinking, Carol? I have always been impressed that the Portland area, who when they first we first presented the data and they were received it, they were shocked by actually what they found were lower enrollment numbers for Medicaid than they had ever expected. And so their immediate uh, took action right away to redo what they had done several years prior, which was to enroll as many of the uh, American Indians that were using their system providers and get them enrolled again in Medicaid. They found that they were getting off the rolls of Medicaid and it was too much trouble to get back on. They needed the same kinds of like maintenance work to keep Medicaid enrollment uh, in, intact. And the Portland area has done a lot to use this data for their, uh, to improve their system and capture more payments. What is difficult about using the data is, is making sure and keeping the data confidential. The reason that it is hard to get access to the data is it's medical information and we have a lot of precautions that are taken from beginning to end to see that the data is uh, stripped of confidential information and it's de-identified so that when we're looking at the information, it's, it's absolutely, uh, we w have no idea who these records belong to and could not possibly figure that out, nor could anyone else. We also, uh, find that it's very difficult to get all the information. In other words, we find that claims are, are missing. And most importantly, the fact that, that the user who was entitled to the Medicaid 
uh, services is not recorded as an American Indian. It's called, we call it a misclassification of racially Indians, but it's even more damaging when the IHS eligible American Indians are not recorded as Indians at all on the claims because this data tends to get lost mm -hmm. and what we're looking at is very incomplete data because the states don't, who work with the IHS system providers don't know that they've actually got a record from an IHS system provider for one of these, uh, for this data. One of the things that we know about the data is that the IHS uh, is th really quite clear and, and truly the expert on identifying who are the Indians that are using their system, uh, but they don't have really good data on the types of services they're providing and the costs of those data, of those services. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the exact opposite is true with the Medicaid data sets, uh, who's an Indian is often misclassified, uh, but they're very precise on the type of service that was provided and the dollar value that, uh, or the cost of, of that service. So by bringing those two together, we get uh, not only a more complete view of what's happening to the individual Indian's care, but also uh, a know for sure that we're looking at exactly the right population and we're uh, able to better understand their unique health status. So again, it's in the joining of these two data sets, the weaknesses and the strengths happen to match up and Carol can do the work and we've been very lucky with all of this. Great, great. And I think it's in addition to ensuring the data is accurate um, and it's important to work with providers and health policy makers in the different IHS areas and service units mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. ensure that the analyses that are being done are very useful for their planning and for the, um, their purposes to improve clinical care and the health status of the people they serve. I think it's also true, Dave, that we're hoping that uh, they will themselves uh, try to address the data. Uh, we've got a number of studies that we've done uh, that are available on the CRIB webpage mm -hmm. uh, that have been a part of this uh, CMS funded TTAG directed uh, activity. And uh, there's no doubt secondary uses of this information that uh, we can't even dream of at this point. Uh, once more people uh, essentially address the data and think about how it impacts what they're doing and what it tells them about what's going on in their local healthcare program. Okay, well, thanks again, Jim. So here's another question for the group again, and I, I guess maybe I'll target you this time, but feel free, anyone, jump in. How can our viewers in the IHS Tribal and Urban Indian Health Programs use this data in their everyday work? Well, I think from this data, as Carol pointed out, they can look at the types of reimbursements for American Indians and Alaska Natives being served in their region to understand how there's variability between the regions with regard to the amount of funding coming in. Then I'd say the second thing would be is for the Indian Health Service tribal and urban providers to work with their local Medicaid agencies to understand and assess opportunities for um, billing for services that would really enhance care for people with certain conditions, such as diabetes, heart disease, or perhaps adolescents with mental health needs. It's very important that all the IHS system providers, the administrators know who their state Medicaid tribal liaison or IHS liaison, they're named differently in different states, but who that person is, and if that person changes, who, who it's changing to, because they have to work closely so that Medicaid, state Medicaid programs learn better uh, how to capture and identify this data and, and uh, enrich the databases that they provide to the federal uh, system. This is especially true because there are many system providers who have to deal with more than one state. So they have to deal with more than one Medicaid program, more than one liaison, and more than one uh, system of capturing data, that's very important and we're, we're asking that burden to be shared now. And it's an ongoing process. You, the regulations are always changing and evolving. New opportunities exist, such as under health care reform. So having that ongoing relationship to understand opportunities to improve care will be, is really important, especially in the coming years. 
Okay. Well, Jim, if I may, I want to target you with this one because they both touched on something that it, maybe you can expand on. Now that our viewers know this data is available, what advice would you give them about accessing and using the data? Uh, well, the simplest thing would be to uh, get on their web browser uh, and uh, search out California Rural Indian Health Board. Uh, our web address is www.crihb dot org and you can find under the research tab a whole series of publications that uh, we've put together uh, under at the direction of the CMS TTAG. On the slide it shows that you have to go into the policy and action part which is how we view data. It is only not to just collect data and archive it but to put policy into action and you'll find the research tab under that and national documents. Uh, under that particular part as well. Well, this question again is for the group. What's the future of the project? Do you see any further developments on the horizon? Oh, we're doing some really exciting work right now and uh, particularly pertains to how the uh, mix of resources, uh, CMS and IHS resources, uh, differ by IHS area. You might think that the Indian Health Service uh, has a uniform sort of resource allocation process, but actually it's uh, an alluvial thing that's grown <coughs> up over time. Uh, and so that uh, when the Medicaid program uh, became available for billing in 76, uh, the IHS uh, really <laughs> never took advantage of it. And over time, they've learned to coordinate better with it. So we're doing some research on uh, how much uh, reimbursement is uh, coming in per IHS client uh, through all their providers, not just the IHS provider site. Uh, and we hope that it will help inform the IHS and their allocation of their Indian Health Care Improvement Fund monies. Uh, that's a special pot of funds that uh, uh, Congress set aside to improve funding equity. Uh, the IHS is not a defined benefit system. It's sort of like discretionary. What happens depends on the funding availability, the local leadership of the tribe, or the IHS system. Uh, it's a real mix. And uh, this next research we're going to do is, I think, going to be very informative to how uh, the agency can affirmatively make sure that there's equal access across all of Indian country. Okay. And where can our audience find more information about this project? Well, I think the IHS uh, webpage is a good place to go under uh, non-medical programs. They have a whole section on the Indian Healthcare Improvement Fund. And of course, as our work gets uh, done, we'll be uh, reporting out to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Tribal Advisory Group, group uh, and the TTAG. Uh, so attending those meetings is another good way to uh, stay informed of how this research is uh, evolving over time. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their contribution to this discussion and for joining us today. Kitty? We've covered a lot of information today. I'd like to thank Jim Crouch, Carol Kornbrot, and Joan O'Connell for sharing their insights on the impact of Medicare and Medicaid data on Indian Country. We're at the end of our Medicine Dish Show, and I want to thank you for your participation in our broadcast. Our next broadcast will be on the third Wednesday of June, that's June 15th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can access previous Medicine Dish programs at a new location on the NIH website, videocast.nih.gov. Go to past events, select trainings and meetings, and then select CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or find us on YouTube under Medicine Dish. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed and benefited from today's Medicine Dish show. I'm Kitty Marks, host of Medicine Dish, wishing you a very productive day. <laughs>